This is the Seahawkers podcast, episode 438. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers, and I am joined by my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. A little earlier in the day than we normally do this, which I think makes us both a little extra sharp, or maybe it makes us a little extra dull. I don't know which, but either way, we're going to be talking about our expectations for the Seahawks this season, as we do annually. And Brandon, I don't know if you feel um, like it's a little easier to set your expectations this year or harder or somewhere in between. It's one of those things. I I know that we must set expectations for the team because we do that every year, which, you know, happy anniversary to you on this 11th annual episode that we have been posting since we started. And I would say that it is a little bit more difficult just based on the fact of new coaching staff, a new regime. I mean, the the only two people that are constant uh, from last year are what general manager John Schneider and defensive backs coach Carl Scott. So, um, you know, it, it does make it a little bit tougher not having that previous experience to work off of. Um, but that's fine. That's we, I, I still know that I have expectations. Absolutely. I think uh, everybody does. And especially after preseason week one here, I think expectations have changed for a lot of people. I know it definitely skewed mine a little bit as I sat down and thought about this a little bit yesterday, which is about all the prep I did for this show, because we're just going to wing this because uh, we didn't really talk much beforehand about how we wanted to break this down or anything. We just decided about 30 seconds before we turned on the mic which uh, that usually leads to gold, right? You're not supposed to let them know. Like they, they need to know that we put a lot of work into the show because it's an, it's a really important show. Well, just because we're winging it doesn't mean that it's any less work. It's, it's more work in the moment as we do the show. So it's the same amount of work either way, whether you put in that work beforehand or you do it on game day. Look, I know that's not how championship teams are built, but ours is because we just, keep rocking it throughout each and every year in each and every season. Um, Did this preseason game change your expectations for this team, Brandon? I think it did because I, well, I just not having any information going into the preseason game, you're left to at least make some sorts of conclusions. Uh, But one thing that came through, I feel like in the preseason game you're able to to see some of the intensity, some of the the preparation. You're able to hear some of, you know, some people get excited and then you hear the coach saying, hey, we haven't done anything yet. And so it kind of it gives you more insight into their preparation and mindset going into the season and how they respond to that. I, I know it definitely informed how I felt about the team one week ago versus this week. Yeah, it definitely changed things a bit for me. And it's interesting that Coach Mike uses some of the same language as Pete did, you know, as far as, well, we haven't done anything yet. Oh, sure. that sort of thing. And that's uh, probably across the board for all coaches. It's pretty boilerplate uh, coach speak. But what do you say we start out with some different position groups in we talked a little bit before because that was our entirety of our prep. Let's start offense. Let's start offense. And yeah, I, I think it would be good to go through kind of our expectations of each position group because I have expectations for that are different for the receiving group versus the offensive line group. I, it, it is just a little bit different. And, you know, now that I have the expectations that Brady Russell is going to be a future Hall of Fame tight end. You know, that's mm-hmm. something that's changed from two weeks ago to my expectations following the game. Oh, a hundred percent. So let's start with tight ends then with future Hall of Famer Brady Russell. It was a good game by him. Scored the touchdown, looked good, both blocking and receiving, but obviously not at the top of the depth chart at the position. No. And when you look at the tight end depth chart, he would he would have been one that I probably would have disregarded immediately because Tyler Mabry is a guy that I recognize having been with the team for multiple seasons. A.J. Barner drafted in the fourth round out of Michigan, so he has that connection to the coach already. They bring in Farrell Brown. He was one of the guys they brought in early on. 
as part of a, a free agency move and a solid blocking tight end and a competent receiving tight end. You kind of think of him as the uh, the replacement for Will Disley and then Noah Fant coming back on a contract. And you kind of felt like, OK, well, we have four guys and then we go and watch a preseason game with Brady Russell and he's playing special teams and he's lining up in multiple spots as tight end. You're like, oh, well, this guy is like kind of a multi-tool type player. When you add in the the ability to play special teams, too, he's kind of feeling like our, um, you know, a special teams captain type of guy. There you go. Possibly the Nick Ballore replacement, yeah. although maybe in play, but in personality, he's not the Nick Ballore replacement because the Nick Ballore replacement personality wise is Pharaoh Brown. I don't know if anybody has listened to many of his interviews, but what a delightful human being to listen to when he's speaking about the team or life or anything, just an awesome attitude and a guy that is super easy to root for out of the gate. And let's not get it twisted. He's always going to be ahead of Brady Russell and Tyler Mayberry on the depth chart. I, I think Russell showed that he's probably a better blocker than Mabry is, and maybe that allows him to jump up to third on the depth chart there. But I think 95% of the snaps, barring injury, are going to go to Noah Fant and Farrell Brown with two different skill sets. And are we going to see that kind of same rotation of players as we did with Noah Fant and Disley with Noah Fant and Farrell Brown, considering their disparate skill sets? I think we probably will tend to see those two especially. And I think that it, it will be interesting to see the way Ryan Grubb handles these two in terms of position groupings because I know as a defense, if I saw Noah Fant out on the field, I would tend to think it's a passing down and Farrell Brown on the field that it's a running down. With Farrell Brown, too, you talk about his interviews. I He was one of my favorite guys to listen to. And hear him talking even about just how he takes blocking as, um, you know, takes it into an account and talking about how you know, he was really looking forward to blocking for K9 because he, he, he enjoys blocking on the outside zone runs a lot more than the inside ones because then he has to, it's a completely different approach that he takes to blocking because he's saying how, yeah. Uh, if I have to go straight up against these 300 pound dudes, it's a little bit tougher for me. But if we're going outside, you know, I can use some leverage. I can get them off balance and we end up having a little bit more space to work with it, rather than just pounding it inside. And um, so, yeah, he, he really does sound like a guy who is proud of his, his blocking craft. And for a guy who would like to see canine succeed this year, we'll get into running backs here in a minute. But uh, Farrell Brown's the type of mentality I want to see in my tight end. If you do go back and look at some of the Washington stuff, he did use Grubb an H back quite a bit, kind of that hybrid tight end fullback kind of situation, which that's kind of fun. I do like that. And with that said, in Farrell Brown's acumen at blocking, I think that here's my hot take expectation for the season 2024. Mm -hmm. I think we see a lot more Farrell Brown, especially by the end of the year in this offense than Noah Fant, because they do utilize the tight end in the passing game a little bit, or at least they did in Washington, but not very much. It's not exactly the focal point of that offense. So I think that Farrell Brown's skill set, especially when you're running out of, you know, three and four wide receiver type situations or three wide receiver situations he's going to be more valuable as a blocker trying to get that run game going. And we saw that Ryan Grubb was really trying hard to get the run game going in preseason. With that in mind, it does feel like Fant. And it would be a little bit different, I think, if you didn't have DK and Tyler and JSN as your three primary receiving options. It almost feels like you don't need the tight end as a receiver. If Say they're happy with Brown and Barner and Brady Russell, and, and maybe Mabry is a practice squad guy. I don't even know if he has eligibility left uh, based on how long he's been with the team. But it almost feels like Fant could be a guy that, you know, maybe you don't really need, but it, it would be helpful to have as a, 
in terms of depth as a passing option, I suppose. For sure. And the other thing that makes me feel like there might be fewer snaps for Noah Fant is if I'm bringing in Farrell Brown primarily as the blocking tight end, okay, cool. Then if I'm going to try to use that position or, you know, something akin to that position in the passing game, I'd rather take somebody with the body type of Jake Bobo and put him out there as that receiving option that has a much higher upside as a pass catcher and still has some chops as a blocker. We've seen him early on here with the Seahawks be a good and willing blocker from the wide receiver position. I think a combination of all these things just really cuts into the overall effectiveness of Noah Fant, which means that he will probably go for 1,200 yards and 90 receptions this year. We're, we're, we're going to have low expectations, but that doesn't mean that he can outshine everybody's expectations and, and be the all-pro tight end that uh, we know he can be. Absolutely. And look, this is a great time to say how I deal with expectations in life as a whole. I set the bar awfully low, and then everything is a freaking win. So if you get a little frustrated with some of the expectations being low, understand I'm just setting myself up and you, the listener, up for future success and happiness. Yeah, that way, that way you also have that ability to come back to Adam and say, hey, look what a moron, uh, look what kind of moron you were in the season yeah. expectations show. Totally not expecting this guy to do so well, and then he does well. And then you can have that enjoyment of saying I, I i believe that i'm right and you're wrong absolutely see i'm just a giver like that's what i'm trying to do here but i think that kind of covers tight ends because i honestly think on the offense man like that out of the skill positions probably the most boring to talk about this year in particular that was a great idea to start off with that one being the most boring one you knock it out you get it out of the way that it's on to more fun see low expectations man Jake Bobo's fun. JSN's fun. The wide receiver group is fun. And the fact that Bobo is the fourth one and is so much fun. I I think, you know, when you talk about fun, it's the it's seeing them block, um, but also have success as a pass catcher. But we saw in the preseason game, JSN was a, a blocking uh, Savant too, blocking one of the safeties down the field and coach Mike in one of the press conference highlighting that that was one that was highlighted for the entire team. Right on. And you hear by all accounts too, that JSN has put in the work this off season and really done everything that he can to raise his game up from his rookie year. And that's exciting to hear because when you pair a guy with this sort of talent with Tyler in DK, now you have something pretty extraordinary, especially in an offense that likes to really throw the ball around and stretch the field and all of that stuff, supposedly, uh, even though the preseason game kind of showed something a little different. Uh, but you're right. When you talk about the receivers, Brandon, a lot of fun. And it reminds me very much of the country song. No such thing as too much fun. <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as too much fun with this wide receiver core. My expectations are honestly through the roof for each and every one of these guys because of the history of Ryan Grubb and what I think this is going to look like with the reports of how Geno's looked in camp, getting them the ball and everything that can transpire from all of that. So uh, yeah, sky high for me with the receivers. It is. And it led Clinton Bonner when we were talking on three and three out, which you can subscribe to on uh, the believe podcast network, the title of the show uh, if you look for it, there is for the Hakra. It's going to have three in, three out. It's going to have what if. It's going to have the PNW Prop Stars shows all right there through that feed. So if you're listening audio only, be sure and check out for the Hakra and plug that into your Apple Podcasts app or wherever you listen. But one of the things that Clinton was concerned about on three in, three out this week is having too many wide receivers. Maybe, maybe there's too much fun. Like, who do you decide to cut this down to when you have at least four spots locked up. And then if you do five or six, you're choosing between LaVisca Chenault, who had a really nice return. You saw Aesop Winston in, in the, uh, you know, the, the punt game in the return game. So he's special teamer. You have Derek young. Who's been with the team now for a couple of years. You've got D Eskridge trying to make it back. And then you have some other guys mixed in there, too, like Cody White. But obviously, 
you're looking at a max of two guys beyond that. And, you know, maybe for some people, there's there's more than two that you want to bring onto the team. Look, man, how dare Clinton go against singer songwriter Daryl Singletary, <laughs> who says that there is no such thing as too much fun. Like, look, if they do end up and they will, they'll end up cutting a fair amount of these receivers. I think they'll probably end up keeping five. That makes sense to me. The big three, obviously Bobo. And then I think Chenault just in terms of the return ability, I think that that's going to be a huge boon for teams this season with the special teams, because I know there wasn't a lot going on in preseason week one with the return game, but I think that's going to change as the season progresses and teams experiment with this a little bit more and kind of figure out the nuts and bolts of it. I think LaVisca Chenault can be a difference maker in the return game. So I think it's going to be those five guys and they're going to each and every one of them have monster seasons in comparison to seasons past for each and every one of them. So maybe yeah, if, if your favorite guy doesn't make it, maybe they'll make it to the practice squad and mm-hmm. they'll be fine. And Shoot, D. Eskridge was already sitting out Monday practice following a weekend game, so he's in midseason form. Look, I'm done with D. Eskridge. I got sucked into that way too many times over the years. Like, no, thank you. I'm good on that. Look, Derek Young, nice guy, decent backup player, but has never been able to break through. If he doesn't end up making the roster, I'm not going to shed a tear over it. Cody White, kind of the same way. And so on and so forth with some of the other names that we don't think about all that often. So, um, yeah, man, I think that the guys that they do have, especially at the top and with Bobo as the depth piece, I think we probably end up with another DK Tyler thousand yards a piece kind of season with JSN knocking on the door around 800 yards. And you could even flip flop the Tyler and JSN numbers and that wouldn't surprise me either. And it wouldn't hurt my feelings either if if JSN were able, like you said, he put in the work in the offseason. If they start getting him a few more snaps because he's in there for critical third downs and able to convert on some of those and, and DK too, if Tyler's seeing the ball a little bit less, it's it's not a terrible thing necessarily because then you're you're kind of working toward the future of the team and also you're keeping Tyler healthy for his big time moments when he does shine and you know whether he goes for a thousand or 800 yards I, i'm not going to think anything differently of tyler lockett so it uh i am though in terms of expectations dk metcalf i think he has the capability of being a featured component of this offense more so than i think we've seen with any other offensive coordinator before with Seattle. Yeah. And it would make sense. Look, his skill set is so unique in the league with his just physical stature and the way that he can body up dudes, the way he can high point the ball. We did get frustrated at times last year of the Seahawks trying to force the ball to DK. It seemed like at times, I think that you can have an increase in production from DK without playing into forcing the ball to him. And I think that Grubb's passing attack, while I feel like overall is has some college stuff in it that doesn't get me excited, some of the route concepts and everything are very pro-based. And you start flooding the field with that many viable pass-catching options – and DK is going to pop open enough that you can get the ball to him enough without it feeling forced that his numbers are really the highest they've been maybe in his career. And he's kind of hitting that physical peak as a player too, where these are the prime DK years. He's hitting that physical peak, but he's also hitting, you know, the, the mental part of it, I think continues to grow because we saw growth from him even going into last year where his route running was more crisp. He was, you know, able to, I think, you know, fool some of the defenders a little bit more easily. And then you layer that on top with what some of the things that Grubb does with his concepts, like you're mentioning. If if he's not getting open, he's probably going to be drawing some of that coverage then that allows guys like Tyler and guys like JSN to get open. Absolutely. And 
there's going to be different situations week to week where one guy shines and another doesn't only because the overall talent of this room, this group, them trying to take away one dude, other guys having a bunch of success because of it, take away another dude. Then the other guys that they were taking away the week before they'll have a bunch of success. This is going to be, I think one of the most fun groups for this team all year long. And I'm really looking forward to that part of it in rooting my ass off for all these guys. Plus Gino. If it's not the receivers, though, I, I think the running back group can be fun. And I, I think it has the ability to be fun both in the running game and through the passing game. We we hear that Kenneth Walker might be more of a receiving option with this offense. You know, Zach Charbonnet coming back for a second year. I, I think he has the opportunity to improve. And then it seems like they're going to have a decision to make of where they want to go between Kenny McIntosh and George Halani for that third running back spot. And after watching the preseason game, I, I don't know if I have a good beat on which one of those I expect to be the guy. I just hope that we don't really get to the third running back all that often. Look, I haven't seen a lot of Halani, obviously, as he's entered the league here. Didn't play much in the preseason game. He played it enough. sounds like. It sounds like his running style. I mean, he had a touchdown, obviously. So yeah. that was cool. His running style probably fits more of the way that I like football to be played. Uh -huh. But with that said, last year, Kenny McIntosh throughout camp and everything really shined. It looked great. And people were talking about him. Plays in this preseason game. A gamer. Looks like he's ready to roll. I'm not going to wring my hands too much over... Is it going to be Halani or McIntosh as a third string running back? And what does that mean going forward? I don't really care. I think for me in this offense, it seems like McIntosh would be the more logical fit. We'll see which way they go. But in terms of K9 and Charbonnet and expectations for them, um, look, in the preseason game, obviously they ran the ball a little bit more than I had feared they wouldn't which was nice with that said, was that them working on the run game in preseason because they have the opportunity to do it. Or is that run pass ratio going to be what they kind of go with going forward? And obviously it'll vary week to week, but is it going to be that sort of philosophy? We don't know that yet. I've got one data point that says the preseason game that says we're going to run the ball a little bit more than you expect. That's cool. And then I have, an entire career of data points of Ryan Grubb throughout college that says, no, no, they're going to throw the ball a hell of a lot more. So with that in mind, I think that in terms of rushing yards, Charbonnet himself is probably going to suffer the most, but K9 probably not going to be a lot more rushing yards than he had last year. And like you said, the difference may be being made up as a pass catcher, which has its pluses and minuses of all the skill position players on the offense. I feel like just scheme wise, this one probably skews down as opposed to the wide receivers skewing up. Interesting. I don't know if you can be any more divergent from a run pass ratio and play calling than Shane Waldron was last season. So I, I feel like it has to it has to trend back. And hopefully, if you are converting more third downs than they were last year, that yeah. uh, they're going to have the opportunity then to uh, build up, you know, it, to run more plays like, you know, P, you can actually get to your stuff, um, <laughs> yeah. as, as Pete Carroll would say. And one of the things that was promising from the preseason perspective was watching Ryan Grubb call plays on third and long and actually draw up plays that got the ball past the sticks on a third and long. Because, yeah, you're, you're not converting those as a high percentage if you're just handing the ball off and running the give up play because it's a give up play. You're giving up. And while you may convert those one out of 20 times, you have the opportunity at least to do that. Um, throwing downfield a little bit more. It takes us back into what we were talking about with receivers, but it, I think it plays into this too. And, and while if we're drawing off a of preseason, the ability to run screens isn't there, but I, I think that getting 
a designed play of K9 into space with blockers out in front of him. Like if if we just do that a little bit more, I think e- even if he doesn't have the the rushing yards from previous seasons, if we see a an increase of 60% of his passing or his receiving yards in the passing game and he starts to be more of that Marshall Falk style back, I I could I could get into that. Yeah. It's not my preferred way to play football, but it does <laughs> work for. Pre- it, it, but it, it does it work still, for a year it, or two. I, I mean, that's basically what we've seen over the history of the league, right? Is right. when you play that that brand of football, you can usually when the talent is really high and you don't start suffering from the disease of more from your players and getting talent picked off by other teams over the years, you can do that sort of football for a year or two before it starts to fall off. Um, it's not something you can hang your hat on year after year after year after year. Right. Um, but it can work for a short period of time. So if that's the way that it goes, then I guess so be it. Enjoy the fun while it lasts. And then we figure out what to do differently from there. But if I, I the Bill Walsh school of thought of short passes are an extension of the running game, it's, true and bill walsh was a smart dude don't get me wrong but it's also not true like it is not the same physicality of running the football and wearing other teams out especially the defensive fronts and i think overall that becomes a problem but look just getting the ball in canine's hands any way shape or form is always a good idea because he is one of the most electric backs i have seen in terms of guys that the Seahawks have brought in over the years, just with his running style and what he's able to bring to the table. I am thrilled to see K9 with the rock in any way, shape or form. Can the offensive line substitute for some of that physicality? And I asked that knowing that yeah, in the run game, like it's inherently physical. And even if you have big physical dudes in the past game, it's not going to be, The same. It's not going to wear down a defensive line dropping back 65% of the time. But with this group of offensive linemen, are they, do they have that capability, do you think? To be, to be a a physically dominant group. If Abe Lucas is your starter for the majority of the season, then I say yes. Because I do think that. Connor Williams is a very good run blocker and maybe not as good as a pass blocker, but still a very good run blocker. Obviously Charles cross has been taking steps this year and you've heard everybody gush about him. Looking back at the preseason game and watching a little bit more of Christian Haynes, that dude can play football, man. And whether it's at left guard or right guard, I don't really care. I have a feeling that he's going to be a guy that, ends up taking a lot of the snaps at one of the guard positions. Lakin Tomlinson is big enough to be, you know, an average run blocking guy. And you combine all that together in all of a sudden you have a fairly physical group. Now, does Grubb take advantage of that? I don't know. We'll see. But I think it has the makings of a really solid group. Maybe one of the best we've seen in a while in is it Scott Huff, the O line coach that he brought with him yeah. from UW? High pedigree, a guy that is very highly thought of around the league in terms of his ability to coach up offensive line. I'm excited to see where the offensive line goes this year, way more so than maybe previous ones. I am excited too because when you, it kind of felt early on that it hinged on Abe Lucas and the health of his knee and if he was going to be able to play. Having George Fant at depth, yeah, I was a little bit concerned of, of where the depth might be beyond that. McClendon Curtis playing right tackle. We saw him out there with the first team. And I thought, you know, apart from getting beat one time, he was he was going up against one of their top starters on the Chargers. And yeah, yeah, he got beat one time. So that's your third guy, though, now that at the right tackle spot that you know that can kind of play right tackle. And right now on the depth chart, I think they have him backing up Lake and Tomlinson. But when you look at Tomlinson, who I'm probably the most, I don't know, 
I'm probably the most bearish on him, but the idea that you got Anthony Bradford, you got Christian Haynes, and you know, if you had to in a pinch push out Connor Williams to guard and bring in Oluwatimi at center, I, I feel like this group has the opportunity to be the most versatile. And apart from Charles Cross, the drop off then from him to Stone Forsyth. Like there's not a ton of drop off from position to position that I see on the O line. Yeah, it could be a very solid group. You said bearish on Tomlinson. I hate that phrase, bearish and bullish, because it's wrong. It's backwards. <laughs> right. Bears are awesome and aggressive. Like that that should be like, you know, you're you're excited about them. And bullish, bulls sit out in a field and just eat grass all Believe day. Believe me, when I t- used that term, yeah. I was trying to decide which one was the bear and which one was the bull and which one was more awesome and not. And I had a hard time thinking of it. So I, I guess I'm the most uh, not optimistic <laughs> about Tomlinson. There you go. There you go. I'm glad I'm not the only one who struggles with that one because it does seem like a backwards metaphor. But uh, think yeah, of a bear I, as a teddy bear and not a grizzly bear. And then you got it down. Well, I mean, I take Winnie the Pooh over most bulls anyways. Like <laughs> literally, they're just big fat bastards that sit out in a field and eat grass until it's time to, you know, do their job. And we all know what that is. Right. Right. So uh, I, I don't have a lot of respect for the bull. Although if you mess with them, you get the horns, which I think is what a lot of defenses are going to find when they tangle with this offensive line. I think this is going to be a better group overall. I think we're going to see some consistency and if they can really move people on the third and shorts in a way that we never did under Waldron, I think that's going to be a massive difference in this offense. It, I feel like a lot of the success of the offense does hinge on this offensive line, though. And, man, if you have any weak link to where we're getting to week four and they're like, and we're just seeing one dude get beat consistently, I, I think it has the ability to to take a lot of this down. So then how do they, you know, how does Scott Huff work with Ryan Grubb then to figure out a way to mitigate that? And it's those types of adjustments then that are going to be really interesting to watch, I think, as the season progresses. Yeah, I feel like the weakest link is going to be one of the guard positions if you were going to pick one. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I feel like you could get Bradford over at the right guard spot and he's at least serviceable, if not downright scary in the run game, which is awesome. Scary good. And then have Haynes over at the left guard spot, even if Tomlinson struggles, I think that would be very functional as well. So even if you do get down to the weakest link, I think these guys are going to be okay. And that's why I'm probably, um, I'm going to say bearish because I'm going to use bearish in the way that I want to use it. (laughs) An awesome bear. Yeah. Well, I expect Geno Smith to be one of those guys. I'm bearish then on Geno Smith going into the season Rawr. at the helm for the Seahawks. <laughs> bearish in a good way uh, with Sam Howell, P.J. Walker. I mean, I'm kind of curious. I saw enough from P.J. Walker to be like, hey, if they carry three quarterbacks into the season, like I, I, I don't mind P.J. Walker. It's not like It's not like in past seasons where you looked at the third quarterback spot on the Seattle Seahawks team, and you thought, oh, well, that dude's just there to be in camp. There's no way that he is ever making the team because why? How dare you speak about Ehlers in, in that way? <laughs> I can't believe you would disparage the the hefty, mini hefty lefty that way. But yes, you're right. I think PJ Walker is a professional football player. I, yeah. We've seen him in different leagues have success, on different teams have some modicum of success. The only place that he really struggled was in Carolina. And to be honest, I don't know if you drop Joe Montana in there and it looks better, right? Like that's a tough place to play right now. And I do like where we are at with the quarterback position, because while I'm uh, bullish on Sam Howell in the way that I think about bulls, (laughs) in terms of him being like a future franchise guy and that sort of thing. I do think that he is a highly capable backup quarterback in. I like having him there in that role. And then you get to Gino and this is maybe the one position that 
I'm probably the highest on. And I think that this is a career year for Geno Smith. It helps him secure a future bag. I think it secures him as a Seahawks quarterback for another year, maybe two. And he's being talked about as one of those top 10, top eight guys by everyone in the national media because you just can't deny the production in the way that it looks. I think that this is going to be, I know Gino was the comeback player of the year. The first year that he came back and was the starter. It's going to be a re comeback year for Gino Smith. And I think we're all going to be looking at him in a even more positive light than we were before. Look, he was injured for two games, so that makes him eligible to be comeback player of the year for real. To where point. maybe he wasn't eligible the year that he actually won it under the new rules, but now under the current rules, he can be eligible. So, yeah, Geno Smith, comeback player of the year. I One thing that I'm really excited about, and I don't know if I would have been able to say this about any other you know, potential quarterback for the Seahawks, but... Making this transition, we we saw Russ transition from different OCs to new OCs ooh, during ooh, his time. I, I want to add one thing to that. I saw different OCs transition to Russ and turn their offense into the Russ offense each and uh-huh, every time. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, I didn't see Russ transition. Jack, <laughs> it was always it was always the coordinator. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you, and that's really the point that I was yeah. going to make is that Gino has now he's learned different systems in so many different places transition, you know, going to the jets from West Virginia, then going to the giants, then going to, uh, was it San Diego at the time? Uh, so he's made these transitions, then come to Seattle, run the offense and run it in a way that looks like a professional offense, not going to what Geno Smith does really well, which is, you know, for what he did in college, was throw the crap out of the football and he's able to run that effectively. And so, yeah, making this transition now from a a professional offensive coordinator and Shane Waldron to Ryan Grubb, who has run a lot of college offenses and hasn't necessarily made that transition to pro. I, I think it has that potential to work really well because you have a guy like Geno Smith that has seen a lot, and has overcome a lot and has a lot of weapons to go with it. Yeah, I think you bring up the argument for Geno Smith you know, to the detractors, which is, what is it that he doesn't do well? Right. Because he really does do everything pretty doggone well. And you think about his success at West Virginia. That was in a spread offense, throw it around like you were talking about. And I do feel like it's, this offense will be more similar to that than maybe a Schottenheimer offense, especially when he was with the Jets, especially when Gino was with the Jets. Right. So I I think that he has shown that he can adapt to pretty much any sort of play style because he has a good enough skill set, whether that's being able to run around with his legs or because you wouldn't run around with anything else, I guess. You'd run around with (laughs) your legs. You do use your legs. Yeah, yeah. uh, Really good insight by me. And then uh, you know, a good arm, accurate, good decision-making, all the things. I think he can really plug and play in just about anything. And he's going to have the opportunities, I believe, just in terms of reps with Ryan Grubb in this offense going forward. As long as he has that time behind the offensive line. And we saw last year, even when the offensive line struggled throughout the season, he was still able to make dudes miss, find guys down the field. Yeah, whether or not in the system, though, I guess it would come down to turnovers. And while we've seen him take care of the ball, it's where does that mindset then from Grubb leak in to because with Pete, it was like, don't turn the ball over. That's the most important thing. How does that part transition then from Grubb and the way he views things? Like, is he going to be more aggressive? making Gino a little more aggressive, is that going to lead to turnovers? That could be a part where we see the offense break down a little bit. We saw Gino end up with, what, 20 touchdowns last year? Yeah. In however many picks. I want to say, was it 11 picks? It was double digits, but it wasn't 
high end of the double digits. No, it was uh, on the low end. Okay, so uh, 20 touchdowns, nine interceptions last year. I think that you're going to end up in the high 30s on the touchdown passes. Okay. And the interceptions absolutely will rise, but probably to the 13 to 15 mark. I don't think it's going to be outrageously high, but... About one a game, one every other game, right in there, feels about right for Geno. Yeah, in this was, sort of aggressive offense. So it was double digits in 2022. That's when he had the 11. And the only other times he was in double digits was when he was starting for the Jets, his first two seasons, 21 interceptions that first year, and then 13 the following year. He, he didn't throw it quite as much, but uh, yeah, it did improve. And then... Yeah, for him to go and, and do that then at Seattle, the 30 and 11 on his, his comeback player season, impressive. So I, I guess I, man, with Ryan Grubb, with Gino, how do you not have that expectation then that he should be able to eclipse and, and then earn in his contract those escalating bonuses for beating 4,200 yards, providing he's, he plays a full healthy season? But passing, you know, 4,300 yards, passing the 30 touchdown number. And then, yeah, as long as he keeps those interceptions down. But also, I, I, yeah, I have a hard time. Now, completion percentage, it might be hard to hit that 70% rate. But yards and touchdowns, I, I have to think that that's going up. Yeah, I'd expect completion percentage. I was going to say expectations and completions got tangled up in my head at the same time. I wanted to say both Com words at once. Complex expectations. A, a complex expectations uh, <laughs> percentage. Uh, I think that's going to end up probably in the 67% range. Yards I could give two shots about. Don't care. Yards don't matter. It, touchdowns, it, it like I said. It matters to Gino when he gets uh, his paycheck based off Good of point. It. Good point. That's the only part of it that matters to me then, because I want Gino to keep getting them checks for sure. But a career year for Gino, that's my expectation. As long as he stays healthy, which I think he will, he's shown a good track record towards such things. I'm really, really high on Gino Smith because the physical part of his game has not diminished. And he's at that point in his career for quarterbacks where the mentals have gotten to peak peak level and the game is relatively easy. And then also Ryan Grubb's offense will be new to the league. And I think that's going to cause a problem for defensive coordinators, especially early on, especially when the weather's good. And I think that's going to really help Gino hit those escalators and all of us be Gino Smith believers, even the detractors by the end of this year. Although I, in terms of expectations for Gino, I, I expect him to lose in the playoffs. I mean, the guy can't win in the playoffs. He, he just, mm. he can't do it. And, you know, every single year we, we point out something that Gino Smith can't do. You know, he can't lead in 2022. He can't lead uh, a quarterback room. He, he can't lead the Seahawks. He's going to be replaced mid year. And yet we, we saw him finish the season last year. We said, Gino Smith, he, he can't be a comeback quarterback. He, he just doesn't, he's not a comeback type of dude. Oh, uh, now he has the most comeback uh, wins in the past two seasons, and uh, just from you know, based on what he did last year. So I, I need to set an expectation for something that Geno can't do to prove me wrong. Dude can't win in the playoffs. Uh, Geno Smith can't win a Super Bowl uh, this year, especially. So yeah, let's just put that out there for Geno. Make sure that gets back to him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, prove me wrong, I dare you, Geno. I'll be really mad about it. You've, you've proved us wrong year after year in other regards as a fan base as a whole. So yes. keep, keep doing what you're doing, buddy. Moving on to defense. We, we've got a, a bit fewer position groups. That's one of the nice things about the defense. They, they, those position groups, they all, they all kind of got to make it simple for defensive guys. You know, <laughs> you know, three, five or six position groups. No, we're, we're doing three. We're doing defensive line. We're doing linebackers. We're doing secondary. And let's start with. Let's start with the secondary because it might be one of the more complicated ones because you have two new guys that are starters with Rayshon Jenkins and uh, a new starter in the way that he doesn't have his old teammate back there with Julian Love. See how I worked that mistake into an actual thing. Um. Well done. Well done. You're a professional. 
<laughs> it's like career I've been doing this. for Brandon Schultz podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Julian Love, Rayshon Jenkins there on the back end. And I, I do have some question marks of, of what we're going to see out of that pair. But yet I look at the corner positions with Trey Brown, with Reek Woolen, with Devin Witherspoon. I'm as excited about that trio as I am excited about the wide receiver trio. Oh, a hundred percent. If you're going to start at the back end here at corner, I mean, Spoon, we all know Spoon is that dude. Like, he is just that dude. And to watch what Mike McDonald does with that chess piece over the course of this year, it, there may be no other thing I'm fired up more about uh, this season than that right there. Because he's an electric player with a coach that knows how to utilize that sort of dude. Super stoked about that. Then you talk about Reek and... Damn, he'd look good in that preseason game. He looks so good. He did. He did. And just listening to him talk and taking the criticism from last year to heart, I think. And also knowing that, look, there's a lot of places he could really improve in his game. And I think he's going to do it. I think Mike McDonald is the type of guy to keep that guy accountable and keep him on the rails. I think it's going to be a huge year for him. And then you talk about, Trey Brown and Mike Jack and Artie Burns. That's a deep, deep group of guys who can legitimately play. Maybe not the world beaters of the league, but guys you can roll out there and be like, look, we can hold up with these guys for two, three games until so-and-so gets back. It's the second strongest position group on the defense. And I'm super jacked about it. And they have young guys with DJ James and Nehemiah Pritchett pushing them too. You know, they're trying to get a roster spot. I, they're going to have a tough time making it with, with all the depth that they have among the veterans. And yeah, you bring up Reek Woolen and you hear how he's approaching the season. It, it's kind of one of those things too, where it's got to be cool for him in the way that they're talking about him being the guy to follow around the top receivers and really placing that high expectations on reek because I, one, you listen to him and he seems like a guy who is up for it. And so that's what, that's what you want to hear. And you know, hopefully that's then what translates that, that he kind of grows into that because it's something that we haven't seen from him. Now we've seen him cover some top dudes in the league when they've lined up across from him, but there, there is going to be a transition of making that work and, and being that guy that, you know, you have to be at the top of your game every single week. If you're going up against those top dudes. So, you know, how he's able to to handle that's going to say a lot, but I, I think he really is in position to be that guy. And Witherspoon, one of my favorite things from the preseason is seeing even the press conference dynamic of Witherspoon walking off the field and chirping at Mike McDonald as he's giving his press conference and, and coach Mike chirping back at him during those moments. It's like they have this playful thing uh, between these two guys. And then with those expectations you have of Witherspoon being that guy, I think it's just fun to see. It is fun to see. And it's infectious. And you talk about Reek following the number one around the field and something that Pete Carroll refused to do because his explanation was always, well, you, it's really hard to learn that kick step technique when it's left side or right side. Like basically you have to figure out how to uh, make nuclear fusion work to be able to flip flop sides of the field. And I, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pete slander in the second half of the show. Okay. But uh, with that said, that was one of the things that did drive me nuts about Pete is like, look, I, I don't think that it's rocket surgery to move and flip flop sides of the field and keep your number one cover guy with the number one receiver, which also then keeps him out of run support in a lot of ways, which is his weakness, which then accentuates the positives of everybody else around him. I'm really excited that coach Mike is like, no, no, you, you go where the number one goes. I think that's going to be cool. And then Spoon's energy is just so freaking infectious that I think it can do nothing but help. And then having Julian Love, the consummate professional in the back end, 
at the safety position is huge. We saw him really take a step up, I think, last year. And obviously, the Seahawks agreed. That's why they gave him the contract. And then Jenkins kind of has an attitude about him that I think fits in with what Mike McDonald is trying to accomplish here. I feel awesome about the back end. My expectations are high for this group. Yeah, and it's funny with this group, you know, the the position groups on offense, we kind of started looking at the depth first before we got to the excitement the, that we have with some of the starters. And, you know, we didn't bring up Kayvon Wallace uh, and what we saw from him in the preseason. Like, he looks like he has the ability to step in and, and play as well as a potential starter, which I think, you know, as Seahawks fans, we've always kind of had that love for safety depth whether it was Jamal Adams or, you know, going back even years before, they, they've always seemed to have that guy at safety that you're like, Ooh, you know, he does some unique things and is able to come in and, and Hey, maybe we want to see more of those. I don't know if I do, unless we're doing running six defensive backs out on the field, which is altogether possible maybe with sure. the, the depth that we have at linebacker. But um, you know, to your point about Reek Woolen too, and the idea of traveling, he was interviewed and asked about, you know, well, you know, just how hard is it to make that transition to be the guy to follow around some of the top receivers? And he, he's like, no, it's not that hard. No, he's like, I can totally do that. And I'm really hoping that Kayvon Wallace turns into my new Ryan Neal, Mm -hmm. who I had a massive player crush on and he easily could. And don't forget Marquise Blair. I mean, he could be, a guy that resurrects his career back home in Seattle. That's interesting to think about. And you're right for as much excitement as I have about the back end, the linebacker position. Yeah. It's a little, little iffier. Although I thought Dotson played well in the preseason game. Radigan played well. I think Knight actually acquitted himself pretty well for Mm -hmm. the most part, had some rookie mistakes in there, but Holy cow. It was his first preseason game. The Cowspell kid, let's not forget him, Patrick O'Connell. I was excited about him, too. We didn't get to see Baker. But, again, going back to the way that Miami fans felt about him, that gets me at least confident that he can be a dude that is able to kind of shoulder the load there and be Bobby Wagner's replacement. It kind of speaks to the Mike McDonald defense, too. Like, I don't know whether or not to include guys like Nwosu or Hall or Mafe in the linebacker group or the defensive line group, because as they list the depth chart, they have Nwosu set up as a strong side linebacker. They have a, a, a position called rush, which, you know, doesn't have a, a defensive. Normally you'd see in a, in a four, three defense, you got your two defensive ends. You got your two defensive tackles in the Mike McDonald depth chart. You've got a, a defensive end, a nose tackle, a defensive tackle. You've got a rush backer, and then you have your normal weak side, middle, strong side linebackers. You don't even have like the inside, outside linebackers that you would see in a normal 3-4 defense. So that is already causing confusion for me in where to talk about which position groups. Okay, this is where I'm going to admit a little bit of ignorance, and then also I think it's a valid point. <laughs> Look, when they talk about three fours and four threes, nine times out of 10, there's four freaking dudes on the line of scrimmage. Okay. Yeah. And if you call the dudes on the end, a linebacker, cool. If you call them a defensive end, cool. But there's four freaking guys there. Okay. Like I, and then possibly three like linebackers behind them or two. If you're playing nickel, it's the same shit. It's the same guy. Catfish. And it frustrates me to no end that people talk about these two systems as if they're unbelievably different. Now I do get that, you know, in a three, four, maybe your nose tackle is playing more straight up over the center as, you know, comparison to a four, yeah, three. I know there's differences nuance in the to it, yeah. but yeah, like the idea that, uh, Uchenna Nuosu is a linebacker and not a DN shut the Cat f- fish. up. Like, as he's doing the same exact thing one way or the other. And I'm, and I'm stoked about it because I think Uchenna is, is a freaking amazing player and really made a difference for the Seahawks the last two years. And I'm excited to have him back. A lot of people I know were asking, well, going into the season, oh, do we go back to 4-3 or 3-4? Or what, what does Mike McDonald like to use? And then I think it was on the very first series against, 
Um, Because it was weird. It was weird watching them line up in a traditional 4-3 against the Chargers offense. And it's like, okay, not having that expectation of of really what even to expect going into the preseason. And I'm and I'm seeing Nuosu kind of line up as a just a strong side linebacker in a traditional 4-3 with four guys up on the line of scrimmage. And then you know, he he walks down to the line uh, before the ball is snapped, and it's like, okay, yeah, what what really is the difference here between these defenses? I think it's just terminology, so people feel like that they sound smart. <laughs> I, I genuinely believe that. And the deeper and deeper I get into the X's and O's of football over the course of my lifetime, the more I realize people just make up new terms for guys doing the same thing, and then feel like they sound so smarty pants. And you can't keep up with the changing terminology. And maybe this is just an old man rant of get off my lawn and I hate how everything is changing. Maybe it's the same sort of thing with the kids with their newfangled language. But either way, it frustrates me because I look at this group up front and whether you call them linebackers or DNs or whatever, defensive tackles or nose tackles or whatever, this group. This is why I'm excited for the back end of the defense, because I think they're going to wreak absolute havoc on opposing offenses. I am excited in particular about, especially when I look at the guys who aren't listed as starters and I see Byron Murphy first round pick and seeing what he did in the preseason game. I go, Ooh, he's not a starter. He's, he's a depth piece. You look at Mike Morris, not a starter, but Ooh, what he saw in pre we saw from him in preseason. That's a fun depth piece. You got Boye Mafe, not listed as a starter, who I think could be a double digit sack guy. He's not listed as a starter. No, you've got Jaron Reed, you've got Jonathan Hankins, Leo Williams, and Draymond Jones as listed as those four starters. Let's throw Nuosu in there too. Derek Hall listed as a second string guy. And we saw him pushing around starters on the Chargers offensive line. That guy is strong. He's built up the strength and, and can bull rush. And we even saw some speed around the outside. Can Derek Hall then make that guy be one of those guys that can make that jump? Man, if you have two levels on the defensive line of guys who you're excited about, at least when you, when you get to that second level of group, if you're excited about all those guys and, and you got solid starters ahead of them. Oh man. And Mike McDonald as the the head coach slash defensive guru. This could be fun. Which website are you looking at for the depth chart? Because I'm looking at ESPN and it sounds a little different, which is interesting. For example, ESPN has Jaron Reed as the starting nose tackle and also the starting LDE. (laughs) So whether that's left defensive end or what, I'm not entirely sure. But he's starting two positions at once, which... Look, I wouldn't put it past Jaron Reed. He's that kind of player. So I I am using the Our Lads depth chart, which mm. I find is is pretty good because I, I think it also mimics what the Seahawks put out just as their initial depth chart. Gotcha. And gotcha. and the, and I I remember it being their initial depth chart because I had that same kind of uh when I when I saw it that seeing the rush position and then seeing the three linebacker positions, not seeing an outside or inside linebacker. that And, and so I, our lads is more mimicked, I think, the uh, the Seahawks depth chart. Sweet. Well, I'll keep using this wrong one. And with, <laughs> with that... You've been doing uh, great so far. Well, thank you. Thank you. Look, one of the things I think as fans we have the hardest time doing is overvaluing the talent on our team. Mm-hmm. And I look at this defensive line. And I think to myself, Jaron Reed, really good football player, you know, definitely above average, if not upper tier at his position. Is that an unreasonable thought for that level of player in comparison to the way that the rest of the league might look at him? And honestly, no. I mean, that's he's been that sort of guy everywhere he's been throughout his entire career. There's a track record, even with the Packers and everywhere else that he's been that says, look, that's the type of player he is. So I'm not overestimating him. Leonard Williams, the big cat, freaking awesome player, upper tier interior defensive lineman. 
That's my thought process. And I think what most Seattle fans think when they think of Leonard Williams, is that an outsized uh, opinion of Leonard Williams? No, the rest of the league thinks he's freaking awesome too. Right. Okay, cool. Then I'm not overrating him in terms of backups, Byron Murphy, uh, second defensive player taken in the draft. I think he's going to be amazing. He looked awesome in the first preseason game. Is that an outsized expectation or thought about him? No, the rest of the league seems to agree. Everybody else is talking the same way. You go on down the list and it's not like I'm looking at any of these guys and being like, I think he's really good and nobody thinks he's really good around the league and then being wrong about it. The whole league kind of as a consensus looks at Draymond Jones, Leonard Williams, Echenna Nwosu, Jaron Reed, Jonathan Hankins, Mike Moe, that group, and goes, holy crap, they are loaded. And that's what makes me so excited in combination with Mike McDonald's coaching style for this entire group. The flip side to this, though, is that you go down the list and you go, well, Jaron Reed was here last year. They, they couldn't stop the run. Leo Williams was here last year. They struggled down the stretch to stop the run. Nuosu, okay, he was hurt down the stretch, but he was also in there early on in the season when they were having trouble stopping the run. Draymond Jones, back for another year, struggled stopping the run. So you you take all those players coming back and you go, okay, Mike McDonald, is he the one guy then, as a head coach, going to be able to make these guys who struggled to stop the run last year all of a sudden to be able to stop the run? It's a good point. It's a good point. And you ask if Mike McDonald is the one guy and the answer is no, because it's not going to be just one guy that makes this change because you bring in Hankins and you draft Murphy. I was apoplectic at the end of the draft, not this year, but last year when they forego spending high draft capital on nose tackle or interior defensive line, the big space eater, right? And I said, this is going to be a problem in stopping the run going down the stretch. And lo and behold, you can't plug in one dude, one guy that you invested in, in Jared Reed and expect the whole thing to work. And then bring in Draymond Jones and be like, oh yeah, it's going to be going to be great. Draymond Jones was not known as a run stuffer when he was in Denver. The difference this year is not just Mike McDonald. It's that you bring in that true space eater, professional space eater in Hankins. And then you pair him with the dynamic Byron Murphy. And I know it's cliche, but it all starts up front and in the middle. And I've been screaming this into a microphone for years. And the first preseason game shows exactly the dividends that you get out of investing heavily in that position. And that's exactly what the Seahawks did this off season finally. And I think if they had done it last year, we might still be talking about Pete Carroll as our head coach. I think that's how big of a difference this is going to be for this team. And unless I see Mike McDonald starting Daryl Taylor on the edge in run situations, we're going to have some problems in terms of depth. Because I feel like just as we talked about with the offensive line and having that one week link that teams are then able to exploit, I, I think you have that on defense, too. Because if you have Daryl Taylor lined up on the same side of the field that you have Reek Woolen, as an offensive coordinator, I go, oh, I know exactly what we're going to do on first down. We're going to run to that side of the field. If Daryl Taylor sees a first down, I will be stunned. The only reason he should be on this roster going forward is to be a third down specialist and a pass rush guy. And honestly, I wouldn't mind giving Derek Hall all those snaps instead. Sure. Like if you're not going to have Mafe out there with Nuosu in those situations, I cannot for the life of me understand the Daryl Taylor obsession by this football team. I don't get it. I'd rather move on. I don't know if it's an obsession at this point, because when they had a decision to make this offseason of whether or not to pay him versus let him go, he was a restricted free agent because he sat out his entire first season due to that injury that he suffered in college. And so paying him at the restricted free agent tender amount 
for the amount of production that he puts up, even as a third down specialist, like that, yeah, that's something you invest in. Yeah, okay. I, it's, I, not, I just, it's not a lot. It's not a lot. I'm very low on, I, I'm as uh, Adam bullish as possible when it comes <laughs> to Daryl Taylor. Like, I just, I don't get it. Like, he's not that good of a pass rusher. He's a little streaky. And he's an abomination in the run game. Like, I just, no thank you. Just an absolute no thank you to that particular player. Nice guy. Wish him the best in life. Like, I want to make sure that some of these things we t- say about players Man, is not Daryl personal... Taylor getting the D. Eskridge treatment. Okay, we got one guy on each side of the ball. Yeah, like, I, it, look, it's not personal. Like, we're just talking about the football end of things. And a lot of people seem to get that twisted sometimes. So I want to be sure to throw that out there. Um, yeah, I've had enough, Daryl Taylor, to last me six lifetimes. I'm just glad, Adam, that we have proven our ability to be unbiased Seahawks fans. Like, not everybody on this team is awesome. We, we've we pointed at a couple places where, yeah, we have some concerns there. Oh, sure. Out of the uh, 22 starters, I think we identified two dudes who maybe were like, yeah, I don't know. And the rest of the dudes are awesome. And so we are totally unbiased. And uh, I think that's great. Like, I'm, I'm really proud of us. Pat on the back for you and me. I thought it was important to point out, like, for these people who listen and go, man, what a bunch of homers. No, take a step back. We are bearish on everybody except for a couple guys. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I'm glad we're also able to confuse those terms for everybody else. And so you, you don't even know how exactly we feel when it comes to certain players. That's yeah, exactly right. Point back and said, "Oh man, I, well, I said I was bullish on that guy." Right? Yeah. I mean, go back and listen to the tape. How did you? How did you get that misconstrued? No, it's funny. So I think that kind of brings us to just overall expectations for the team for the season in each side of the ball, Brandon. Where where do you fall on this? Like, because I do think that again, it's one of the more interesting years to make this sort of prediction. And it's difficult, too, because I don't necessarily have that high, you know, we're going to the Super Bowl expectation because I I have to be realistic with that idea of a first year head coach and a first year offensive coordinator with no NFL experience. And on on a team where Mike McDonald is preaching the importance of communication, like how do you get an understanding of the defense? the right communication and have the guys all on the same page right within the season to be able to, to do all that right away to go up against other NFL teams that have had years then to build upon. And so it's that part of it that I, I kind of question of, of how it's all going to come together. And and so you do see that play out and just how some of the national pundits view the Seahawks, right? They, they see those parts of it on the, on the top level and, and have those similar concerns to where they go, Oh, well, you know, maybe the Seahawks do finish at the bottom of the NFC West. And, and I, I have a hard time thinking that they're going to finish worse than the Cardinals who are just, you know, uniquely bad all the time. And so I, I think they'll be better than that, but as excited as I am about the defense, I have that question of whether or not they can start, quickly and watching them play as, as well as they did in the preseason against third string quarterback, Easton stick. It it kind of went against that a little bit. It was like, Oh, look at another third down stop, another third down stop. Oh, maybe, maybe my idea that this defense is going to start slow because of that idea of communication being so critical. Maybe Mike McDonald has this worked out. Maybe it is so simple that they can implement this quickly and have success. So I am a little bit conflicted when it comes to how that's going to fit for the defense. Yeah. Starting with the defense overall and the expectations, my thought process going into this season before the preseason was we have a data point of Mike McDonald starting his defense with the Ravens a couple years back and then really struggling for the first four or five games as they learned the communication and the technique and how it's all supposed to come together exactly as you had expressed it here just now. And 
that was going to be my expectation. And then I saw the preseason game. And don't overreact or underreact to preseason games, right? But let's say that the defense can start out half as good as they looked against the Chargers, where they went three and out, three and out, three and out, pick three and out. Like it was an absolute disaster against second stringer Easton Stick. Somehow he's the <laughs> second stringer there. I don't know how, but yeah, I think he's if the they third can do- stringer. It's Justin Herbert, first stringer. Injured Justin Herbert, second stringer. Way to bring back that callback to Russell Wilson, the starter. Injured Russell Wilson, the uh, backup. So I think I've changed my expectation for the defense based off of one preseason game, which is absolutely absurd. But I do think that Mike clearly figured out that there's a different way to implement the defense out the jump because of his experience with the Ravens. And you saw guys all the way down to the third string knowing exactly what to do, where to be, and to be tackling well early. Mm -hmm. And all that surprised me a little bit. So when you talk about that front seven, especially the defensive line, being as good as it is talent-wise with Mike's acumen as a coach, we had the discussion, does a great secondary set up a defensive line or does a defensive line set up a great secondary a few years back? And we got that chicken or the egg answer. And it's the chicken, the defensive line. (laughs) Yeah. Take care of your chicken up front to quote Marshawn. And with these guys, I think it's really going to make the back end look good. And I expect this defense to be pretty damn good all year. It's going to have ups and downs, but from beginning to end, instead of having the slow start that I was thinking they were going to have, which lowered maybe my overall win total in my head initially, I think it's going to look good all year. Uh, bumps up that win total a little bit for me. I think that Mike McDonald is going to prove out to be the defensive genius that he is early on and consistently throughout. And if they can do that, it makes it that much more likely that then they can find a way to have success on the offense because you do have that concern of, okay, at what point, do teams start to figure out some of these guys who have come from the college ranks? You, you look back to just any of the, the previous coaches then that make that transition from college to the pros. Like a lot of times you do see them have success early on. And then it gets to, you know, week six, week seven, week eight. And now NFL defenses, they have an answer. And a lot of those coaches were so stubborn and that their ideas were going to work, that they had to work because they've always worked, that they're just going to power through it because we don't need to adjust. This is just, it's somebody else's fault. It's, you know, the Bruce Arians. Well, this guy's not doing his job, so it's not (laughs) my fault. This guy's not doing his job. And I, you tend to see that mentality. I don't see that there. With Ryan Grubb, you, you, you don't, and most importantly, you don't hear it from Ryan Grubb because even in the little bits of press conferences we get, he's talked about how they've tried one thing or, or a new co- a coach within the staff has come up with a, a concept and they, they've been able to work through it. And so if there's that kind of coordination and communication right now early in the season, I, I think that has the ability then to translate And if they're and that's why I point to the defense, that if they're having that kind of success, then even if they get to those points within the regular season, at least if they have that mindset, then to be able to work through some of those areas where you you see other teams start to figure it out, then I I think they have the ability to work through it. And, And that's why I'm pretty optimistic about the offense, too. So I think that the offense is going to start fast and fade late, you know, just to kind of piggyback onto what you were kind of driving at there. And, but the fade might not be as hard as some of the other guys that have come into the league and tried to implement their system from the college ranks for Ryan Grubb. I think it's going to be a little of a lesser fade. And the reason why is you talked about Arians and Chip Kelly and Steve Spurrier and like all those sort of guys, Kingsbury. Yeah. Their egos are off the charts. 
like beyond off the charts. And so, yeah, this this worked early in the year. It's going to work late in the year. It worked in college. It's always going to work. And I'm a genius. And if it doesn't work, it's not my fault. Exactly. And one of my favorite things about Ryan Grubb is he seems to be the antithesis of that. Like, I really love listening to the guy talk. And, like, the way the guy just operates as a human, seemingly, I mean, from afar, as much as we can see. I think that the ego part of it in adapting to what defenses throw at him late I don't think that's going to be a big problem for him. I think where the regression comes throughout the second half of the year, because I think some of that's going to hit where defenses figure it out and it's going to take a little while for a grub to adjust and all of that. I think where it's really going to come down to, if it ends up being the pass heavy or more pass heavy offense, like you dub, it's going to be the weather late in the year. That is the difference maker. It really t- puts the halt on things. I look at the Miami Dolphins yep. and the way that their season went last year. And that feels a little like how this grub offense could go in year one. And then maybe in year two, he revamps some things and adjusts some things. But I see the defense being steady all year. The offense start- starting real hot and this team starting pretty hot and ending up with I don't know, six wins through the first half of the season and then things slowing down because the offense then slows down in the second half of the year. But it, with that thought process, my overall win total for this team is higher today than it was before preseason game week one. Allowing one preseason game to, to flip I know. that switch a little bit. But I, I, and I understand why that would be because I, for a preseason week one, your expectations are kind of low because it's it's just the preseason. And then you see them operate in a way you go, Ooh, this is more crisp than I would have expected it to be for preseason week one, which tells you, yeah, they that they've been taking it seriously. There's room to grow. Shoot, that with just the tackling not being an issue straight out of the gate is really exciting. I, I think what you're referring to, yeah, the that Mike McDaniel fade. And I think it's even appropriate, too, because you look at Miami and you look at a team that does emphasize the run. You know, they have a really deep group of running backs, but they're not physical with the way they their running style actually works in a way that would allow them to make that push then through that late season. Because, yes, once you get to the playoffs, unless you're the Kansas City Chiefs, you kind of need that physical running style against those teams to to help help you get through the postseason. If they are able to adjust in that way to then make that late season shift toward that physicality that you need, then that could even up the win total even more. But yeah, until we see it, I tend to lean more toward your direction with that Mike McDaniel type scheme that does tend to fade. You see that even the guys that are known for throwing the football all over the yard in terms of coaching, you've seen them make a shift. You talked about the Chiefs a little bit last year. They really did. No, I understand they had a lack of depth at receiver, and so they had to kind of rely on the run game a little bit more. But one of the things that got them their second ring in a row here is the fact that they were physical with Pacheco and even up the middle. It wasn't just outside sweep and outside zone and fly sweep and all that kind of crap, right? Which is basically what the Dolphins did for the majority of the year. And it worked gangbusters for a while until it didn't. And then I listened to an interview with Sean McVay a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that he realized this last year is that he is switching from a primarily outside zone type guy in philosophy to running a lot more duo in really pounding the rock up front in investing in the interior of his offensive line. He talked at length about it in the interview when asked and knowing that, look, teams have adjusted with smaller personnel that run fast and trying to shut down uh, the idea of stretching the field horizontally. And so now the weakness and they're in two high safeties all the time. So now the weakness is running it hard nosed up the middle 
And that's the adjustment that he is now making going forward. So I'm listening to the greatest offensive minds and Shanahan's always been this way. Be like, look, you got to be physical and run it up the gut. That's where the league is now. And I'm really hoping that Ryan Grubb also comes to that realization, takes it to heart and is able to implement it later in the season or even earlier in the season. Like hell start out with it. I'm good with it. And really not have that fade going down the stretch, but I've watched too many of these college dudes, whether it's Kingsbury go down the list, right? Yeah. Offense looks good early. Yep. Offense looks good early. Then they have late season collapses. It's just how it works. And again, the, the thing that can fix that is ego, which very encouraging to see Ryan Grubb because he's yep. not a high ego dude. So, yeah, if you can't recognize that, then as a professional offensive coordinator, when you have a defensive head coach like Mike McDonald, who understands the way defenses play, if you have a dude on your staff from that Rams offense who's now with Seattle, if you go up against Sean McVay and Shanahan within the division four times a year, if you can't recognize all of that and implement a way to adjust your offense accordingly, then uh, you deserve to struggle. You probably don't belong in the league at that point. And I do believe in Ryan Grubb that way, that he's going to be able to do those things. Again, I love listening to the dude talk. He seems like an awesome guy. I'd love to have a beer around a campfire with the guy. Like that's that sort of guy. So when I have critique about this, this isn't against him, the human. It's just some of the things we've seen in the past in not knowing if he can figure it out going forward. But with all that said, between the defense, I think being steady, the offense starting out fast, maybe slowing down in the second half. I think special teams will be good overall, despite Myers's uh, showing in preseason week one. It's an even year, Brandon. He's going to be good. Dixon's going to be awesome. I do think that Harbaugh is going to do a good job of figuring out how to increase our return game. I think the Niners are going to have a difficult time this year. We're already seeing the tumult with contracts and injuries and the Super Bowl hangover really starting to kick in early for them. I think that's going to bring them down a little bit. I think that this defense is going to be able to shut down McVay for a game and the Cardinals are going to Cardinal. Overall, initially, I was going to say I think this was an eight-win team. I watched the preseason game. I bite into the hype. I think they're going to be a 10-win team this year. I think they're going to be a win better than last year just because they can take the defense from god fucking awful as it was last year to at least middle of the pack. And I think the offense remains fairly steady, you know, with <laughs> which is funny to say, steady in its up and down uh, kind of nature as it was under Waldron, but basically the same, producing enough to kind of keep you in it that – you go from nine wins to 10 wins, even with the new coaching staff. That's where I'm at. 10 wins for the Seahawks this year, a playoff appearance. And whether or not they win a game, I don't know, but that's can't what happen. It can't happen. Geno Smith can't do right. it. Right. I have a hard time not being as hyped as I am about the defense and also about the offense and considering if everything goes well, everyone stays healthy not giving at least one win per side of the ball. So a nine win season last year, to me, that at least gets me to 11. So mm. I, I think I have to go with 11 and six for the team this year. There we go. Okay. The consistency of Brandon Schultz to be just a little bit more positive than I have about everything uh, showing through right there. So there you have it. Double digit wins for the Seahawks this year. It's a lock. Go and place your bets, make all the money, or don't. Let's get to the second half of the show. All right, sounds good. Getting into the second half of the show. Hey, if you made it this far, this was a, a long first half, but uh, hopefully it was all worth it as we got our expectations out for the season, Adam. And I have to say, after... You and I have attended training camps in the past. And so that was one of the things that was eye-opening to me now going to see training camp. 
I, I wish you would have been able to be there too this year because as as much as I told myself that I, I I didn't think you know it's guys running around with you know, and and doing normal types of things that you would see in camp like stretching and and uh, you know practicing catching balls and stuff like how can that be all that much different it was I it was a noticeable difference being at training camp this year okay and was it anything specific or was it just vibes because. I don't know if you've been listening to the political coverage over the last few weeks, but um, vibes are all important. anybody could talk about is vibes and freaking memes, because that's how you run a country. Apparently, uh, it's ridiculous. Well, we're in the post-truth world where with politics, we are not in the post-truth world with uh, training camp and football coverage, thankfully. So that is where we can still ground some of our truth, uh, even though we can get awfully hyped about our own team, which is maybe similar to politics. But. I guess the thing that stood out to me, no, it wasn't the vibes. It was I saw things that I did not see with Pete Carroll. And I, the hard thing for me is you and I, like, we make maybe one trip. And so Mm -hmm. it's hard to judge the consistency over camp of is this really different or did we just, were we just not there on the day that Pete Carroll did these types of things that I saw at a Mike McDonald training camp? So part of it is judging based on what I've heard from players versus what I saw. And we we talked a little bit about tackling in the first half. Adam, I saw guys tackling, not other teammates, but at least tackling padded. Um, well, you know, those things that they put down on the ground to kind of either divide up guys to do their little footwork things. Like they were tackling those and doing the the rolling tackle to the ground. And they were taking big old tires and rolling them across the field. And guys would have to then wrap up, you know, one arm through the tire and the other arm around and take down the tire and tackling it to the ground. And I thought, you know, as much as I've been to Pete Carroll training camps over the past few years, I I don't remember ever seeing that. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up, especially tackling, right? Because I think this kind of goes to something that I alluded to in the first half of the show. And I'm not accusing you of this with your (laughs) comment that you just uh rolled out there. Yeah. So after this first preseason game, I've seen it a lot in the comments of other videos or even other podcasters or pundits talking about the results of week one preseason and being like, Oh man, it looks so much different than a Pete Carroll team. Like, Oh, this is so much better than Pete. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the Pete Carroll slander has been kind of off the hook and you bring up the tackling and you're like, okay, uh, I've seen him bring in the tackling dummies to the ground more than I ever saw with Pete Carroll. Okay, fine. Like I totally agree. And it looks good in preseason week one, but let us not forget that there was a handful of years, five years where the entire league was trying to model the way that they tackle after Pete Carroll and the Seattle Seahawks in Hawk tackling. It's not like he was never good at teaching defense and never good at teaching tackling. Like that he didn't bring the most successful run of football that we've ever seen as Seahawks fans to this organization. And I hear everybody being like, oh, it's so much better under Mike. And God, Pete was terrible. Like, all right, fine. The last couple of years didn't look good under Pete. But I find me a coach who coaches for more than a decade that their message doesn't go stale and the players start to tune it out. I don't care if it's Pete Carroll, Bill Belichick, Phil freaking Jackson in basketball. Like it happens to the best of them. And to kind of hear some of the backhanded slander pointed at Pete Carroll after the first preseason game, to be frank, pissed me off. Sure. Because I think it's forgetting a lot of the greatness that we experienced under his regime. I think back to to some of those preseasons, those initial preseasons with Pete Carroll and how the teams looked in the 2011 preseason, the 2012 preseason, 2013. Like we were blowing other teams out in the preseason. Again, it was the the way that they looked at every single depth of the defense and and even the offense, but more so on defense that really played into it. And I 
I wondered to myself whether it was more of the idea of, okay, new coaches, they're trying to get the most out of their guys. They're going harder in the preseason. And then maybe as they are through the league a little bit that they take a step back and they don't place that much of an emphasis on it. But then I also look at the way that John Harbaugh over the years has kind of placed an emphasis on preseason. And he hasn't lost that despite his many years in the league. And while I think, I mean, I'm with you. It, it does kind of piss me off with the, the Pete Carroll slander, but you do wonder too, like, Maybe there was just a little bit of an edge that was coming off, whether it was with his message or with his expectations that caused it. And I think why it then filters down to some of the fans and going, well, look at the difference. I mean, obviously, I think you can prop up your new guy without you know, throwing the old guy under the bus because you, you can still have that appreciation for all that time. But you can also recognize there being a difference. Oh, 100%. Like, it's one thing to be like, man, this looks a lot better than last year. It's another thing to be like, oh my gosh, Mike McDonald is so much better at this than Pete ever was. Like, which is the sentiment that I get from many of the people who have kind of put that forward. And yeah. I just want to tell those people to not get the Catfish. off. Like, give Pete his props. I'm excited for Mike. I'm excited the idea that he's doing things differently because clearly the change has been good so far. And whether it's the way that Pete coach tackling and defense and his approach to the team and the preseason and all that, that worked great for over a decade. Let's see if Mike McDonald can do that. Yeah. Like he he's, he's one preseason game in and I'm rooting for it. And I think he totally can do it for a decade plus, but it's just hard. It's just really hard. And to say, this has looked good this year as compared to last year. Totally fine. But don't throw Pete under the bus. I, I'm for that, too. Yeah, we can we can have an appreciation for the new and also have an appreciation for the previous. So looking forward to the season for sure. Looking forward to getting to know our new members of the flock who are coming into the season. They went to get in the flock dot com. If you go there, help support our show. Three bucks and above get you into our Discord chat where we hang out on game day. Twelve bucks and above, you get pretty much the same stuff. We give you a little extra bonus of getting into our Facebook Ring of Honor group. You get a call out at the end of uh, a monthly episode like we're going to do at the end of this episode. So, yeah, if you support us at 12 and above, you get a little extra special recognition and Really, you can help support the show at any amount that you want, whether you go to getintheflock.com, whether you send Venmo to at Hakra, whether or not you send a paper check to P.O. Box 8642 in Kalispell, Montana. You know, there, there's all the ways to help support the show. And we have a cool list of executive producers that have been doing it for a long time and at a high level. We've got DCH, Brian Shaw, JC Schilling, and Brian Lowry. If a couple of those names are new, we're going to get to their donations. But uh, a huge thanks to everyone who helps support us. And yeah, it, it, we're looking forward to another great season. Heck yeah, man. If you are in on this season and in on the possibilities for the Seahawks team, then you should be in on getting in the flock. And as we say, as always, we purely look at it as a value for value proposition. So if you get some value out of it and you've got a couple bucks that you don't mind throwing our direction, we'll let you decide what that's worth to you. And it's appreciated in advance. So thank you very much. Levi is in at $5. Welcome to the flock to Levi. Appreciate that, man. See, $5 of value. That's a lot of value, in my opinion. It's good like, value. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. See, it, it kind of breaks down to, you know, uh, five bucks. That's a beer and a bag of chips for a month, you know? Hell yeah. So, you know, that that's that's helpful. And then if you go at the 12 level, shoot, that's a beer a week. It's a beer a week. And uh, we all Even know that. Even in this that economy. Even in this economy, because beerflation is out of control. <laughs> we got Brian Lowry in at 300 for the year. He's back Whoa. donating $25 a month at that tier for a year. And uh, since he came in for the whole year, I'm going to make sure and recognize Brian as an executive producer for the next couple months. Heck yeah, man. Appreciate that a ton, Brian. 
uh, unbelievably generous, man. And that's one of those things it, that blows me away each and every time we get to this time of year because, you know, the little flockers tend to pick up this time of year as we get excited and get into the new season. But it's always more than I could ever dream. And so for Brian to do that, like, dude, appreciate you, man. One Brian to another. We have cornered the market on Brian donations. I, I think we've mentioned this in the past. We generally, the, the Brian support is through the roof and Brian yeah. Shaw coming in via Zell. See, just another way to get uh, support to the show through Zell. $112 from Brian. Thank you much, sir. Dude, appreciate it as always. Uh, original Brian. So thank you for that. And Long, if your name is term, Brian. More, more senior Brian. Yes. He's been with the show longer. Yeah, exactly. So uh, what you should get out of this, if you're listening to this at this point, is that if your name is Brian, then you're kind of obligated to send in a donation of at least $100 or up because that's where the bar has been set by the other Brian's. Another way to look at it, though, is that if your name is Brian, like Brian is kind of holding it down for your name group. And so if your name isn't Brian, like you need to boost up mm. your your name group to to match that's right because you're losing at the always compete at being a little flocker at that point right yeah brian has got this cornered like it, you know john's need to step up that's exactly right john's got to step up yeah take your scots could do the same you never yeah. know like and then we could have a, a breakout surprise star uh here going into the season of like i don't know maybe it'll end up being greg's you just don't know J.C. Schilling is coming in at $313 from Mr. Schilling. And he says, Brandon and Adam, we are back, boys. Two years in Germany with the Air Force are over, and we are back in the Pacific Northwest. Being in Munich for the game was a great way to start off our adventure two years ago. And now I get to go to practice at the VMAC next week with my squadron from McCord as a welcome home. I can't thank you enough for the work that you have been doing over the last two years, keeping me in the loop with everything and making me feel like I didn't miss a beat. I just sent Brandon another off-season bump in honor of my airlift squadron, the 313th. I have been current on my Ring of Honor duties and always sent money via Venmo to avoid fees, but somehow keep falling off the shout-out list. Brandon, do better! Looking forward to the season and hopefully meeting up at the game this year. Keep up the great work from JC. Dude, appreciate you, JC. Shout out to the mighty 313th and long live them. And yeah, man, uh, if you could quit screwing up the shout outs at the end of the show, that'd be great. I I'd appreciate that. Well, he does. He did send me a new audio clip. So, you know, part of if if I am dropping you off the list, part of it is on you to listen to that list and then correct me. Um, so I just, I appreciate JC correcting me and I will make sure and, and fix it going forward. And if you have an audio clip that you can send of yourself saying your name, where you went to school, whatever you want to do, send it to GoHawks at SeahawkersPodcast.com. It makes it a little less likely that I'll forget you. Absolutely. And I appreciate your ability there to flip the script and uh, put it right back on JC, even though he's just catching strays at this point. So. JC is used to this because he is in the military. I know how it works. And okay. leadership always flips it around to a you thing if you uh, if you come up with a problem. Because, you know, if somebody comes to you with a problem as a leader in the military, you go, well, how are you going to fix it? You've identified okay. the problem. Now identify a solution. I see. So uh, basically what you're saying is the higher your rank is in the military, the better you are at gaslighting people. They call it delegation. Oh, that's a that's an amazing way to put that. You bet. Not gaslighting. You're right. I'm sorry. Sorry, General Brandon. R. Cole is back in at $3 a month. Welcome back, R. Cole. Yeah, man. Appreciate you coming back. Looking forward to uh, pretending to compete with you in the Pick'em League again this year. I'm, I'm going to make it to at least week eight this year, man. I'm going to do it. Jeff Stevens, a new member. Welcome to the flock to Jeff. Heck yeah. A newbie even. A new yeah. flocker. So, you know, there's nothing quite like that new flocker smell. I'll tell you that. It's so good. Uh, Alex yeah. Dutton knows what it's like. He's in at $36 for the year. Welcome to the flock to Alex. Hell yeah, man. I really do appreciate it, Alex. And exciting to get uh, this kind of response for the beginning of the season after an off season where a ton of you really did hang in awesome, but it always drops off a little. So to get a little boost now, 
feels good. Yeah, it feels like we're back. We're back, baby. Yeah. A big thanks to David Sanborn. There were, and a big thanks to Brittany Adam because there was money left on the gift card at Guaranteed Barbecue when yeah. I went through. I can't say Wallace anymore because uh, Garen has moved his food truck down an exit to Smelterville. And mm-hmm. now, um, actually, it's probably a little bit more easy to, to get on and off at that exit, which is beneficial to all of us. But a big benefit to me that David Sanborn still had money on that gift card that he donated to us. And I got to close it out. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. Because when Brit swung uh, past there, also brought a little back for me. So I got to enjoy it, David. So appreciate the gift card. And then it trickled down to Brandon eventually. It sounds like that move to Smelterville is just what the doctor ordered because, to be honest, there's not much at that exit, right? There's a Walmart and an O'Reilly's, and that's about it. Uh-huh. And the in the sawmill, the only sawmill to ever stiff me is the one that's right off the exit there. But they went out of business, sold, now it's a new sawmill. So I do think that that's going to be an easier in and out to get your delicious barbecue at Guaranteed Barbecue. So check it out when you go through. And Smelterville is just kind of fun to say on top of all that. It is fun to say. It might not be the most appetizing of town names, but, uh, you know, the it uh, you, you are going to have an appetite when you go to Guaranteed Barbecue. And you're not wrong about the traffic there. So we came through there at probably three or four ish. So an off time in terms of lunch or dinner. And it was still a steady group of people pulling up going up to the window, getting their food and leaving. You look across the street, there's nobody at the dollar store. You look at the other street, there's nobody in the other business. There were probably people at Walmart, but that's farther down the road. But steady stream of people coming through, getting their barbecue. Heck yeah, man. Don't miss out if you do happen to be traveling through the Idaho panhandle on good old I-90. Well, we can't get through a segment without talking about the Pick'em League. And we have a message from Mark Misselbrook, our Pick'em League champion. Here's my new note and a challenge for you. Mark had sent a a note a couple weeks ago, and it turned out to be not as relevant. So he sent me a new note. It says, more than four score and seven months ago, our founders decided they had a dream, a dream where all Seahawks fans are created unequal. You're either a little flocker or you're not. In the spirit, they created a podcast for fans of the Seahawks. This is a date that will live in infamy for fans of all other NFC West teams. So I ask you, as I have returned my support to Ring of Honor level Think not what the Seahawkers podcast can do for you, but what you can do for the Seahawkers podcast. We choose to do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So once more into the breach, dear friends, once more and cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war for Gino, DK and McDonald. Almost finally, I say to you, are you not entertained? And with that, There's just one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Don't come at me with your facts, logic, and reason about any of the above. Wishing everyone the best from Mark. I hold all of Mark's truths uttered there to be self-evident. And I fully concur with everything he had there. Um, Because you're right. Seahawks fans are unequal. Either you're a little flocker or you're a freeloader. And... You've got the two years to be a freeloader, but if it's been longer than that, I don't know how you sleep at night with the guilt. So good luck with it. I am all about Mark's action, boss. Very good. Well, I show up each and every week just so I don't get fined. And I think with that, I need to tell people how to get into the Pick'em League because we have a new season. We are continuing to do it at CBS Sports. If you go to SeahawkersPodcast.com, Not only can you find the link to subscribe, to find those shows that you may have enjoyed and listened to on the platform from previous years, like 3 In, 3 Out, like the PNW Prop Stars, like What If with the awesome Phil Lydic bringing questions to us each and every week that we help preview games. You find the links to that. You find the links to For the Hawkera. Subscribe to that. Subscribe here to the Seahawkers podcast, which you should be already. But... In addition, the Pick'em League link is there. If you've never joined us for a Pick'em League, 
I do send out prizes eventually. In fact, the top five prizes, except for who am I waiting on? I am waiting to hear back from one person. Um, I will name you now, so you don't have to wonder. But I am waiting to hear from Hotlanta Hawk. Mr. Brooks, send me your information. What we can work out for you for a prize. But I have everybody else's prizes going out this week. And then I'm going to work to the weekly prizes, which you'll have one of three things to choose from. And some people won two weeks, so they'll have two of three things to choose from. Um, But see, prizes, they go out sometime. And uh, that's just no going in to the Pick'em League that uh, it it sometimes, you know, you sometimes have to wait a little bit. You betcha. I mean, look, I am just grateful that you do as much as you do to get them out when you do. So thank you for doing that, man. It's a big effort. And yeah, it's got to be a little fun packaging up the prizes and feeling like uh, Santa Claus with uh, a little less of a white beard. It's a little bit bittersweet because as I know that um, that Mark is a big Steve Largent fan, like I've had the signed Steve Largent helmet uh, not far from me to look at and enjoy for the past year that now I have to say goodbye. Um, so, but I know that that Mark's going to enjoy it as a as a Steve Largent. Absolutely, and uh, I hope you are able to say goodbye uh, without thinking about yesterday. I hope uh, it's, it's I hope so that hard. works for you. It's yeah. so hard. It's so hard. Let's get on to do better and better at life. All right, man. My do better this week is for Meta, not because they changed their name from Facebook to Meta, which that in itself should be a uh, do better just right there. Yeah. But they had to pay $1.4 billion after being found guilty in a lawsuit brought forward by the state of Texas for using facial recognition technology without the user's permission. So basically what had happened is uh, a couple years back, I think it was, Oh, I don't know, 2019 or so. Facebook introduces the facial recognition thing, Mm -hmm. right? And fingerprints and all that stuff, recognition. And they had it set so that the default was that option was turned on, making it so that it was basically like Batman using the, uh, the cell phones of everybody in the world to be able to see into every single room. Right. As Morgan Freeman said that there was a bad idea Mm -hmm. the whole time, like be the surveillance state. That's basically what Meta was doing out of the gate. They were just like, oh, yeah, we're rolling this thing out and uh, you're not going to read the terms of agreement. So um, here's the update. And now we're just going to take all this uh, facial recognition data in and put it into our database and feed it into freaking AI. So that was something that got on to the radar of Texas Attorney General. Uh, Ken Paxton and files a lawsuit. They get nailed for it. And basically at the end of the day, bet is like, Oh yeah, our bad. Here's some money. And don't worry. We're going to delete all that facial recognition data and all that stuff. Bull catfish. There is no way that they're deleting all that. I'm sure the NSA has it all. So to meta for being part of the surveillance state, I'm sick of your guys's game. Do better. Well, you don't think that they already sold it off to somebody and that's what yeah. helped pay them for to to be able to settle the lawsuit? Sure, they can delete it now, but if they really need it, they can just buy it back from whoever they sold it to. So no big deal, right? They probably sold it for like three billion, knowing they were gonna have to pay like a bunch of money out in lawsuits yeah. and was like You'd still make oh a my billion. gosh, I still made a billion and a half. Yeah. Like I'd love that. That would work for me too. steal everybody's face and then sell it online for billions of dollars. I wonder if now if pictures of our daughter will stop being recognized then as another family member. That was one of the weirdest things I remember seeing is that (laughs) we put in pictures of our daughter and it would like automatically tag um, her aunt because I don't know, I guess she looked enough like her that Facebook thought it was her and just would. And so they would always show up under uh, her profile, like our pictures of our kid would always show up under uh, the aunt's profile. Very weird. That is very weird. Apparently the uh, facial recognition software had a hard time 
dealing with uh, genetic uh, closeness. Like that seems like it was struggling with that. It, it seems hard, but well, they still have it figured out to where uh, they can listen to whatever we're talking about and deliver us ads magically for whatever. Like, you know, something that you and I have never talked about, but um, you know, maybe you and I should take a trip sometime to Thailand. And sure. you and I now are suddenly going to magically get ads on our phone about cheap flights to Thailand. Absolutely. Uh, Want to go to Thailand badly and have a bunch of curry. So don't send me deals for that. Or or curry recipes. So we don't have to travel if we want to have the taste of Thailand at home. That's right. Yeah. my Our algorithms both just magically changed uh, just with that right there. So people listening be fun. may have it may have changed your algorithm too. let us know. Yeah, you're welcome. My do better this week is for speaking of food. I have to call out Evan Paul, who probably is working for Applebee's based on the way he wrote this headline. I was looking through just you know, looking through the news on my phone and I come across the headline woman arrested after sharing her Applebee's all you can eat appetizer. And after hearing that headline, Adam, are you, I see your eyes getting wide. You're thinking, oh, I've eaten at Applebee's before. I've shared my food before. Is Applebee's this belligerent at cracking down now on sharing all you can eat food? Because you it's a rule. They tell you ahead of time that you're not supposed to. But, you know, those of us who have kids, we, we always we, sh we share that all the time. And uh, I don't want to be arrested. You read the article from Evan Paul. Oh, it turns out that this woman, it, it wasn't because necessarily she was sharing her all-you-can-eat appetizer. It was because they called 911 because she was th screaming and threatening people after, I mean, maybe it was after that they told her not to uh, to share the appetizers. But apparently the woman got belligerent and she was disturbing everybody. She was getting loud, arguing with the staff. And when the police showed up, it, it didn't sound like it made it any better. And so, wow, she got arrested for being a jerk inside a restaurant, not because of sharing her Applebee's appetizer. Evan Paul, with your headline writing, you're working for the Applebee's chain and trying to scare off people into sharing their appetizers, not doing it. We're all going to continue to share our food. You do better. Evan is clearly a man who's in the pocket of Big Buffet mm -hmm. because uh, he's, he's trying to keep everybody from uh, sharing their all you can eat appetizers. Where clearly, I think this represents another giant failure in journalism. We document this all the time on the show. And the one thing that I think the biggest failure of this is, is that it's not reported, at least from what I heard here. Was she sitting at a table or was she sitting at the bar? Because this sounds like somebody who was sitting at the bar and was sharing an appetizer and it turned into a drunken disorderly, not so much a uh, illegal sharing of breadsticks. And that's why I think you're right about being in the, the pocket of Big Buffet. If you write an article about woman gets arrested after being belligerent and drunk, not so much a story. Woman gets arrested for sharing Applebee's appetizer, or all you can eat appetizer. That makes the headlines. That gets people scared about sharing their food from Applebee's because they're not going to stop going, let's be honest. Uh, but they might think twice about sharing it, and that increases the Applebee's profits. And uh, I, yeah, I think this is a well placed article, and we need to know how much Evan made off of placing this article. I don't know, but it's no excuse for spreading the appetizer sharing fear mongering that Evan did here. That's uh, disgusting. It's disgusting. I'm better at life. All right. Well, what's not disgusting, Brandon, for my better at life this week is 11 year old Trace Ramirez, who went to Green Bay Packers family night. I don't know if you saw this or not, man, but this was truly impressive. So one of the things that the Packers did is they brought out some youngins out onto the field to uh, compete in a couple things. And one of them was catching punts, quote unquote. They were doing it out of a jugs machine, like somebody wasn't actually kicking it to them. But this jugs machine was shooting the ball far up into the air and it was simulating catching punts. 
This 11 year old trace goes out there and he doesn't catch one punt. He doesn't catch two punts in a row. He catches three punts in a row and moreover, Brandon and moreover, he didn't just catch one, set the ball down, have the next one come to him, catch it, set the ball down. While impressive, I probably couldn't even do that, let alone at the age of 11. Half of the NFL players out there on the field probably couldn't even do that. He catches one, keeps the ball in his arms, his tiny little 11-year-old arms, catches the second ball, boom! Now he's got, his hands are full of balls. And like, (laughs) now he's got to catch a third ball. He catches a third ball, all balls in his hands (laughs) at once. Team goes crazy. Everybody rushes Trace Ramirez. They do the huddle, jumping around the the kid thing, which was really cool. Trace Ramirez, in his excellent hands, better at life than Skip Bayless. Just impressive. Man, sign that dude up for our team. (laughs) Hell yeah. Okay, so speaking of things that I can't remember seeing at practice, have you? Do you ever remember seeing the jugs machine that does the kickoffs and the punts, or is that something new? I can't recall ever seeing that. No. Yeah, because that was one of the things that I st- that I saw, and it seemed to it just stood out to me because one, they have one that can do the punt spin, which is more of the side mm-hmm. spin, and then they had one that they were using that did the kickoff spin, that kind of did the you know uh. the, the flippy. The ball flippiness mm-hmm. rather yeah, than the end spinniness. Over end. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought that was new because I watched guys field punts and kickoffs for a while. All the while, there was a jugs machine on the side. Tyler Lockett must have caught 200, maybe not 200, at least 100 passes, though, just because he would go, it, it would be to his right. He would catch it, you know, all on the right side, did it for, I don't know, 20, 25 times. Then, Stood on the other side, did it to the left side 20, 25 times, flopped back and forth. And then I would ignore it and I'd go back. Oh, look, Tyler's still practicing catching passes uh, out of the jugs machine. Uh, it was it was really impressive. It was it was all jugs the day that I went and all fights, apparently, too. And that was also the day that I was there. So the takeaway is jugs machines cause fights. So we know that for sure. And then uh-huh. the second thing is. This only illustrates that. Kickers and punters are the laziest SOBs ever in practice. <laughs> they can't even be because, out there punting. They can't even be bothered. Replace me you, with a jugs machine. Right. Yeah, and you can never convince me that catching the consistent spin, the regular spin out of the jugs machine, prepares you better for fielding punts and stuff than having Michael Dixon go out there and put the 15 crazy different spins he does on the ball when he's punting it and having to practice catching that that's got to prepare you better for games, but no, Mike can't be bothered. We can't wear out his punt leg in training camp. Get out of here. Yeah. That, that was a little bit disappointing, but uh, <laughs> it, it was another standout thing for me. Yeah. One thing that also stood out was the day before when the Seahawks invited J.C. Schilling and the airlift squadron that he's a part of. They invited all kinds of military members down to the practice field and they ran him through some drills. And so joining me to talk about it on the show today, J.C. Schilling. He was at the USAA Salute to Service NFL Boot Camp. The Seahawks brought in some military members and yeah, they got to do a few things. And instead of hearing it from me, why don't we hear it from J.C.? J.C., how you doing, man? Oh, man, I'm doing great. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on the show after a long time, little Flocker member. I'm, uh, I, I, yeah, it's been great to be not only back in the States for the last couple of weeks after a couple of years in Germany with the Air Force, but yeah, here on the pod with you. And uh, yeah, I got to say thanks to you and Clinton and Adam and everybody else that's been on the on the pod, keeping me in the loop for the last two years from from across the pond. So just first of all, thanks to you guys for everything you do, the time and effort you put into it. It matters a lot to a lot of us all over the world. So Absolutely, thank you for that, man. Yeah, it's great to to chat live with uh, one of our little flockers. And it must have been great for you to, to come back home after being in Germany. You get invited to the Salute to Service NFL Boot Camp. USAA puts this on every year. Very cool for the Seahawks to continue to do this with Mike McDonald now at the helm and just hearing from what uh, hearing about what it was like. It it sounded like it was a blast. Yeah. I mean, just like you said, thank you to USA. Thank you to the Seahawks for having us. I've been home for two weeks, hit the ground running. 
we got to Germany two years ago, right when the Munich game was happening. So we got to meet Blitz and KJ Wright and this, a couple of the other little flockers that came to Germany for the game. So that felt nice to have the Seahawks follow us. And then as soon as I get home, I get invited. Uh, my airlift squadron down at Joint Base Lewis McCord, the 313th, is, uh, is partnered up with the Seahawks this year. Uh, so we get to do some fun stuff. The first one was this meet and greet. We got to go watch a closed practice and meet some of the players and chat with them after. Uh, we got to run a combine after the players were done out on the field. And let me tell you, a bunch of 40-year-old uh, Air Force reservists, uh, we, were, we didn't have a lot to challenge the Seahawks on. But, uh, but my 40-yard my 40, my 40 dash has slipped a little bit in the last 20 years. But it was, it was fun to participate. It was great to be back. And, uh, yeah, just kind of awe-inspiring to be on the field with these guys and, and seeing just how big they are in real life. Oh, my gosh. It, it's incredible the way that some of those guys can move. And, and yeah, so were you able to break the five-second barrier with your 40 time, I guess is the big question. I was uh, I have five point one nine. I, okay. I did not break the five second barrier. I don't think there's any any uh, any draft kings out there looking to add me to uh, either their team or their fantasy roster at this point. So five one's respectable. You <laughs> you, you broke six, so that that's good. Right? Now sub five would have been impressive, but uh, yeah, five it, one. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I don't think any of us were sub five out there, but uh, yeah, we had we had a great we had a great time. But now yeah. you got to explain to me though, uh, people who are listening, they can't see this in the background. Explain to me what you have in the background behind you, JC. Yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, so uh, the, they didn't open it up to families. It was just the military members. So it was a smaller group. But my son, uh, Hudson, he's six. He drew a Seahawks uh, logo by hand, freehand, uh, spelled out Seahawks at the top phonetically. S E E H O K S. So, you know, trademark that. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the guys, so after the practice was over, they all came over and met uh, the military members and were able to sign some of our, our swag that we had ready to go footballs and cards and stuff. But, uh, but these guys saw this sign, this homemade Seahawks sign and a banner and just, they, they flocked to it. So uh, we, we had the little flockers. They were big flockers that day. Yeah. And, and so I got a lot of really cool signatures Never expected uh, anything like this turnout for the, the guys to come over and hang out with us, but this will be one that we frame and uh, and Hudson will have on on his wall and in his man cave as he grows up. Uh, he's already quite the Seahawks fan, but oh, yeah, man. he's he's start he's starting off he's starting off better than most of us. Let me tell you, that is definitely a, a piece of memorabilia that I think you would cherish forever. And and yeah, it's always fun when they grow up; they can look back and see how they used to spell things and how they used to draw. And so, yes, it, for those who can't see it. It is it is drawn and spelled much like a, a six year old you would expect. So, yes. uh very cool and very cool again to USAA to put this on. JC, really appreciate you coming on and talking about your experience. And uh, yeah, just uh, appreciate you, man, for all yes. the all, everything that you've done for the show over the years. Yeah, thanks, Brandon. It's been it's been great. I appreciate the uh, the shout out again, USA and the Seahawks and and the Little Flockers. I, you know. Just uh, I can't be proud enough to be part of this group. And it was fun to be able to go experience what they do on a day to day basis for just a little while. So a great time from J.C., uh, a great time by the Seahawks. Man, what you didn't hear, too, from J.C., because we probably talked for 15 minutes after I stopped recording, was all of his experiences with the different players, whether it was D.K. Metcalf coming over and signing autographs and talking to all the different military members who were there, whether it was K-9 coming over. You know, he talked about his expectations of K-9 versus what he actually was because he was kind of expecting him to be a more Marshawn Lynch type personality, which he's not. And also he just equally awesome. But uh, just the difference in expectations. He said Jake Bobo was uh, one of the coolest guys. And in fact, he was the only guy who introduced himself to all of the military members there. And yeah, just all the experiences then for him, for all the experiences from the military. So to... Uh, the Seattle Seahawks for continuing to do it for USAA for helping to put this on. You are better at life than Skip Bayless. Super cool and really cool to hear from JC as well. And being part of the airlift squadron, Brandon, I didn't know much about airlift stuff until a few weeks back. I happened to randomly come across it in another video that I mm. was talking about stuff and how much goes into moving all the gear that they move and all that stuff. Like, it's really a huge deal, the logistics behind that. But what I really want to know from JC is, with all the strapping and rigging that all of the members of the airlift squadron do, I want to know that if in the military, after you strap something down, you give it a good jiggle and go, 
That's not going anywhere. Just like every other average dude that's ever loaded a trailer or anything into the back of his truck. I want to know if that translates over to the military as well. I would bet money that it almost certainly happens. Just as when you see a movie and they load something into a truck and it gets right before they drive it away. You got to give it a couple taps on the back of the whatever yeah. vehicle it is and before they drive off. Those things, I think they're not just you know, movie things. These are just life constant things. I think so. I think it's deeply genetically embedded into each and every human on the planet that every time you tie something down, you give it a good shake and you go, that's not, that's going, not anywhere. going anywhere. <laughs> well, I hope none of our 12, 12 and above members are going anywhere because we are giving them a call out at the end of the show. A big thanks to all of our members of the flock. Keith Kedover, a.k.a. Flocktimus Prime, University of Cybertron, Little Flockers, roll out. DCH from Sparks, Nevada, the University of Montana Grizzlies. Gary Blum from Chappaqua, New York, and the University of Pennsylvania, your 2016 Pick'em League champion. Ron Pepper, UNLV Running Rebels, San Francisco, California. This is Hawk Van Dyke from the beautiful city of London and the capital of the UK. Lisa in Seattle. Samuel Gelber, NoHo, California. David Van Cleef, Camus, Washington, home of the papermakers. Leo Chasse, Ludio, Sweden, from Ludio Eskimos and Ren Como in front. Paul from San Diego. Aaron Fisher, coming in from Henderson, Nevada. Go Hawks! Chris Boucher, a.k.a. the biggest little flocker, South Central Louisiana State University. Go Mud Dogs. Hey, it's J.C. Schilling, back from Germany, living on beautiful Whidbey Island now with Quinn and Hudson. Go, Tyler! Go, Gino! Go, Go Hawks! Hawks! Hey, Seahawkers, my name is Garen Taylor. I live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, North Idaho. Hashtag on the rose. Go Hawks! You heard from executive producers DCH and J.C. Schilling. Also a big thanks to executive producers Has No Clue and Brian Shaw. Continuing on down the list of $12 supporters and above. Kicking things off with Rebecca in Manhattan Beach, California. Christina in Manassas, Virginia. Craig in Camas. Jeremiah in the Bronx. Sven in Berlin, Deutschland. Tim in Austin, Texas. Jonathan in Ridgefield. Brandon in Huntersville, North Carolina. Jake in Seattle. James in Beaux Arts. Pepper in Greenville, South Carolina. Kevin in Great Glen, England. Kevin in Surrey, BC. JC in Horsford, England. Hector in Monroe. Tim in Olympia. Glenn in Ocoee, Florida. Ryan in Berlin, Connecticut. Tracy in Kaneohe, Hawaii. Connie in Gothenburg, Sweden. Marvin in Riverdale, Utah. Jeffrey in Kansas City, John in New York, Patrick in Sacramento, Bryson in Eltopia, Jeremy in Federal Way, Josh in Cander, New York, Ken in Hutto, Texas, Mario in Seattle, Brian in Omak, Jeff in Bainbridge Island, Cora in Ditters, Deutschland, Anders in Vila, Denmark, Warren in Dundee, Oregon, Dr. G in League City, Texas, Chris in Austin, Texas, Amy in Squim, Richard in Killeen, Texas, Joseph in Vancouver, Ryan in Salt Lake City, Joshua in the Greater Hockdom, Rafe in Beaverton, Oregon, Jamie in Oswestry, England, Marlon in the Greater Hockdom, Bridget in Redmond, DJ in Menifee, California, BB in the Greater Hockdom, Norma in the Greater Hockdom, Daniel C. in the Greater Hockdom, Jason in Panama City, Florida, Terrence in Dallas, Eugene in Henderson, Nevada. Spooty Poo in Olympia. Kayla in Vancouver. Tanner in Kalispell, Montana. Mark in Bexley Heath, England. Alexander in Oranienburg, Denmark. Ryan in Fairbanks. Sean in Cascade, Iowa via Kalispell, Montana. RJ in Kellogg, Idaho. Jeff in Gilbert, Arizona. Gordon in Valdez, Alaska. Ovary Smasher 69 in Phoenix. Jason in Portland. Oliver in Fort St. John, B.C. Ian in Seattle. B Walls 22 in New York. Jay in Fairbanks. 
Russell in Harpenden, England. Sam in Alamante Springs, Florida. Chris in Manchester, England. Nathan in Fife. Charles in Bremerton. Mike in Kelowna, BC. Edward in the Greater Hockdom. Ken in Stanwood. Stu in Navarre, Florida. Corey in Robertson, Australia. Greg in Lake City, Colorado. Marty in Melbourne, Australia. Chris in Fort Wayne, Indiana. John in Waco, Nebraska. The Poetrist in Boise. RJ in Busiris, Kansas. Martin in Ferrum, Denmark. And Jeremiah in the Greater Hockdom. And that is going to do it for the show. Thanks once again to our members of the flock, to our executive producers, to JC Schilling coming on the show and uh, and being a part of our Better at Life segment. And Adam, for a great season coming up. My goodness, man. Big show. Lots of cool stuff that we covered. Really appreciate all the input from all you guys, including JC. And man, I saw preseason week one, dude. And it just gets the juices flowing. I couldn't be more fired up for this upcoming year. I'm so fired up that I am going to have a hard time not uttering the phrase, we're going to the Super Bowl before the season even starts. Because, Adam, as I continue to get fired up, watching preseason week after week and, and getting all of the vibes of the team, uh, I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it hard for me to hold that back. I hear you, man. And look... At the end of the day, we said that Gino can't possibly win a Super Bowl. So when we said that, now we know for sure we're going to the Super Bowl, Brandon. We're going to the Super Bowl. Heck yeah. I love these expectations. And I think with that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Super Bowl back. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.